Hi everybody, uh, my name is Josh Lewis. I'm the engineering manager at Nerva Energy Group and I'm here today at eWorld to present my presentation on best practices and on-demand ventilation optimization. The overview and learning outcomes for this session are quite straightforward. Uh, you know, the days of constant flow ventilation systems are long past for most facilities outside of hospitals and industrial uh, plants. Um, but there's a wide range of strategies that can be used to create on-demand ventilation systems. Uh, do we know which ones are proven optimal? That's what I'm here to talk about today. So what is demand control ventilation? Let's set the stage here first. So we want to automatically adjust the ventilation of our buildings to uh, and the equipment to match the occupancy within those buildings. Controlling the method that modulates the uh, fresh and outside air being brought into the building because tight management of fresh air intake has significant energy savings uh, across our portfolio. Up to 80% of HVAC energy use can be avoided uh, if we understand the occupancy of our buildings and if we control the fresh air and the ventilation to, those, to that occupancy. Uh, there's lots of standards that talk about this, the primary ones being ASHRAE 62.1 and 62.2 and also ISO uh, ICS 91.140. Uh, uh, these are the standards that engineers have to follow in order to create these on-demand ventilation systems. But within those standards, there are different strategies that can be implemented and some of them are more optimal than others. So what is the case for efficiency? And, and really, you know, what is CO2, right? Um, you know, here we see the graph of the ice core uh, data that, you know, uh, scientists have analyzed over the last 800,000 years. Uh, obviously, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have increased significantly uh, since the industrial era. And, uh, you know, this is the case for efficiency, but CO2 is also the pollutant with inside buildings that we're primarily trying to control uh, our ventilation to uh, in order to keep those CO2 levels reasonable for human comfort and occupancy. So what are the common types of occupancy sensing that we use in buildings to understand what the load of the, of the building is right now? How many people are in it and what do we need to ventilate it to? So CO2 gas measurement is one of the most commonly used. Uh, obviously we have a background level in our atmosphere of about 415 parts per million. It's recommended indoors not to exceed 1,000 parts per million, otherwise sensitive people can start to, uh, start to complain of drowsiness, poor air quality. Uh, really it's ideal to maintain between 600 and 100, 800 ppm. There's other methods we can use to control occupancy sensing within buildings. We can use schedules, uh, occupancy or motion sensors, uh, video counting technology, real-time video counting has become uh, something that's uh, in the market today. Uh, we could use gate admissions or ticket sales if we're in a stadium or even different kinds of smart meters. But CO2 is probably the most common. Um, as you can see by the graphic on there, you know, we breathe in oxygen from our atmosphere and then we exhale about 4% carbon dioxide. So while we're inside buildings, we're constantly contaminating the atmosphere with CO2, which is why it's a primary control point. So where should CO2 levels be monitored within a building? Well, if we're talking about a smaller building, if we're talking about single zone rooftop systems, uh, we typically want to measure the CO2 as close as possible to the occupied space. Um, if we're talking about multi-zone systems, uh, bigger systems in larger buildings like this convention center we're in today, um, if, we're in a, if we're in constant volume uh, areas, we want to look at one sensor per zone closest uh, to where the people are, are expected to be. Uh, but if we're looking at variable volume systems, uh, which is more common for high efficiency, we want to have a, a CO2 sensor uh, per each significantly occupied zone. So what are, what are significantly occupied zones? Well, examples are you know, common areas, meeting rooms, cafeterias, uh, ballrooms. Uh, but we typically don't need to measure the CO2 in personal offices, storage rooms, or lobbies. Uh, these, these areas are more transitory for people. We don't expect a large group of people to uh, be in that, those areas for any significant period of time. Uh, so we can save some money by not measuring CO2 in every area with inside the building. Um, common areas, if we have multiple terminal units uh, within a large common area, we typically only need to use a single CO2 sensor. We do not use, need to use a CO2 sensor for every, uh, every terminal box if it's a shared airspace and a shared common area like you see in many uh, open offices. Now, when we're measuring the CO2, do we want to measure in the duct or the space? Um, now, duct-mounted CO2 sensors have certainly been uh, more common uh, in the past. Um, they're not a bad alternative for single zone systems um, where we have a common return, um, but there's issues with duct-mounted CO2 sensors. Uh, they can often be hidden. Uh, they can often be hard to access uh, and out of sight. 
and they can often have a short life. Uh, it's, not, it's not that uncommon for a CO2, uh, uh, a CO2 duct sensor to only have a year or two of life before it requires replacement or calibration or some kind of maintenance. Um, th this is not optimal because things that are hidden typically aren't maintained, uh, and therefore uh, we our energy efficiency will fall off after time. Today, thermostat mounted sensors are preferred. Um, so that way we're measuring the CO2 level within a specific room, within a specific space. We're getting, we're, instead of getting blended results like we are with duct mounted sensors, we're getting actual results within a room. Thermostat mounted sensors are obviously easy to access and maintain. Uh, and we typically want to mount those three to six feet above the floor. Uh, we want to avoid placing them near ducts, windows, doorways, or where people may breathe on them because that will distort the readings. Um, and sensors should be self-calibrating and have at least a minimum five-year life these days, although the best-in-class sensors have a 10-year life. Uh, so that basically means that you install that CO2 sensor in that thermostat um, and you don't have to think about it for a decade. Uh, it will self-calibrate, self-maintain. It, uh, it just drives down costs uh, and it allows for the best possible results over perpetuity, which is often an issue. Buildings are often uh, very energy efficient when they're immediately commissioned, but that efficiency drops over time and we wanna put measures in place as much as we can in order to uh, mitigate that over the lifetime of the building. So here's some examples of CO2 sensors locations on a multi-zone system. Um, so in this example, the first, uh, the first one on the chart is an executive office. There's no CO2 sensor in an executive office. It's a small office. There might be two or three people in there at most, usually just one person. There's no need to measure the CO2 in that space. But the next three ones are two meeting rooms and an open area uh, in this commercial office building. Those are places we do want to measure CO2. They're going to have large occupancy, a variable occupancy, especially in the meeting rooms, and we want to make sure we're ensuring the indoor air quality levels in those spaces at all times. Uh, but then at the bottom, when we have a quiet room, uh, which is like basically just a, a side room with a phone for quiet conversations and also a storage area. We're not measuring CO2 in these spaces. There's no need to do that. These are not rooms that are normally occupied. So how important are economizers on our rooftop units and, and our systems of making this, uh, you know, getting our energy efficiency? We're measuring the CO2 now. That's great. Um, but the economizers uh, on our rooftop units are just critical to delivering the energy savings and maintaining the indoor air quality. Economizers are often misunderstood and neglected. Uh, they often fail silently on HVAC equipment with immediate impacts, but we don't know it. And without demand control ventilation, without measuring the CO2 in the space, oftentimes we're forced to simply prop that economizer open 10 to 30 percent, and it runs like that at all times during all hours of day, all months of the year. And that basically means that we're bringing fresh air into the building all the time when we don't necessarily need to, but that's often how economizers used to be installed. Um, so the economizers operate in these rooftop units for two major reasons. Obviously they're there to modulate fresh air into the building when needed to bring CO2 levels down and maintain indoor air quality, but they also provide free cooling when the outside air conditions are appropriate. There's a lot of times in commercial buildings where we actually need to cool inside areas of the buildings even in the fall or even in the winter time due to, due to high occupancy load. And if we can use free outdoor air to cool rather than turning on the mechanical cooling systems, that's way more efficient. So it's very important that the economizers stay working. But economizers have several failure modes. Uh, the mechanical linkage can fail, the drive linkages can fail, the actuator drive and the feedback systems can fail, the barometric dampers uh, can jam shut or jam open, uh, and oftentimes economizers are also using enthalpy sensors uh, with inside the unit. And uh, I, I know from talking with many HVAC technicians, including my boss who is one, that ethylene sensors are something that most HVAC technicians can't even troubleshoot on site. They just don't have the tools. Uh, so often they're just neglected, they don't work, and then therefore the economizers don't work. So what are some best practices when it comes to economizers? Well, we want high quality components. We don't want, we don't want a cheaply manufactured uh, economizer damper system. We want one that's, that's gonna last. Uh, we want to constantly monitor the actuator feedback and the supply return and mix temperatures and alarm as soon as something goes out of whack. The rooftop unit and the associated control system should be able to detect an economizer failure almost immediately. And that is critical to warning the building operations personnel to immediately go look up and try to find and fix the issue, both for indoor air quality and for energy efficiency. 
And even a best way we can do today, because we live in a connected world, is we want to get the enthalpy data from a trusted source, not a sensor on the unit. So today we have the internet. Everything's connected. We can just pull the real-time enthalpy data from local weather stations to the local airport. There's no reason to use enthalpy sensors in the units anymore. They're just costly. They're going to fail. They can't be maintained. And, and they're obsolete, really, at this point in time. Now, when we look at supply duct temperatures, constant or variable. Uh, so in, in VAV, or variable air volume systems, uh, they were commonly designed in the past to run at a 55 degree uh, supply air temperature all times, all times, uh, all points of the year. And then we reheated the air when we needed to uh, at, at the VAV boxes with reheat coils, sometimes electric, sometimes hydronic. Um, you know, there were some benefits to those types of systems. Uh, obviously, they had multi-zone temperature control. Uh, we're lowering fan energy consumption because we're only, uh, we're only uh, turning the fan up to the speed that we need to satisfy the demand at uh, the VAV boxes that are currently calling. And uh, there's, you know, there's increased dehumidification potential with that type of setup in order to keep the indoor air quality constant. Um, but there's issues with that. If you think about it, we're constantly cooling the air down and then reheating it. So essentially, we're, we're, we're going both ways all the time. Um, and, 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 and that is costing us extra energy that is really not required in most of these types of multi-zone systems in order to maintain indoor air, uh, acceptable air quality. So where we want to be today is VVT, variable volume and temperature systems. So and, and in a lot of cases, existing VAV systems can be reinvigorated with new controls and turn them into VVT systems without doing any major mechanical infrastructure. Because the temperature delta between the areas that need heating and need cooling, or uh, simultaneously need heating or cooling, can be maintained while changing the duct temperature from hot to cold um, using the existing mechanical infrastructure. This benefits us because we minimize the fresh air in, in intake we're reducing the need to reheat the air at the terminal boxes all the time. Uh, we're optimi therefore optimizing the energy efficiency. And then, like I said, most existing VAV systems, unless they're extreme cases, can be retrofitted with new controls to operate in a VVT mode and be much more efficient. Um, there are some issues uh, that, that we have to look at if we're going to look at converting a system over to use uh, VVT type controls. Um, older systems often utilized bypass or dump dampers uh, in order to relieve excess air pressure from the duct system, especially in a low volume case uh, where there was, uh, you know, uh, just not a lot of call for, for fresh air or ventilation. Um, but we can avoid this in new controls implementations on these, these existing systems by disabling the bypass dampers and implementing what we call dump zones. So we take typically large zones of the system and we designate them as dump zones and that way the, any excess air pressure that can't be relieved through the actual calls are dumped into these larger zones. It doesn't have a huge impact on the temperature in those zones and then we can successfully run the system and still put that energy into the building instead of just bypassing it around. Some other uh, VVT considerations when we're talking about variable volume and temperature control of multi-zone HVAC systems. Um, we always want to try to provide the heat in the air handler first in lieu of the reheat coils, of course, because we're talking about variable supply temperature, where uh, variable duct temperature, where it switches between heating and cooling mode. Uh, sometimes that may mean we need to retrofit heating into existing uh, air handling units in order to make that the case. Uh, return fans on these systems, which are fairly typical, they may not need to sync to the supply fan speed. Uh, a lot of times they're set up that if the supply fan is running at 40 hertz, the return fan runs at 40 hertz. Um, the, oftentimes we see opportunity to run the return fan at a lower speed than the supply fan. Uh, and that's uh, typically due to the ductwork, the way the ductwork's set up, the way the static pressures are, are falling out. Um, there's just not as much static pressure typically on the return side, so you don't need to run that fan at the exact same speed as, as the variable fan, but a lot of people just set them up that way because it's safe, but it's not typically efficient. You can figure that out through calculations. You can also just do trials uh, on, on systems and gradually lowering the return fan speed uh, in order in, 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 and seeing where it ends up in order to keep good airflow. 
Um, and when we're talking about zonal systems, you know, some key considerations, right? You don't want to make a zone too large uh, because if it's, if it's too large, uh, you, you may get temperature stratification across it and the zone may not know whether it needs to heat or cool at that point in time. Um, you don't want to overlap where, uh, potential demand. If, if there's a zone that you think is going to need cooling more often than it needs heating, you don't want to combine that with a zone that is going to need heating more than cooling, uh, especially when you're talking about outside walls or interior spaces where there may be high occupancy load, because otherwise the system may just get confused and you're going to just deliver air to the space and switch in between heating and cooling, and that's certainly not efficient. Um, and you also want to make sure in these, in these variable uh, VAV or VVT systems that the dampers uh, the dampers uh, close tightly. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these systems were originally installed with dampers that are intended to bypass an amount of air. And the reality of it is if, if that room or that space or that part of the zone doesn't need air, then don't give it any air. So reset your dampers or replace your dampers so that they tightly, tightly close in order to not uh, deliver air to zones that don't need it. So. This last, uh, this last gr uh, slide here, we're going we're gonna to take a look at a real-life a real life VVT uh, example to close this uh, presentation off. Um, so these are four graphs from this multi-zone VVT system in a, in a commercial office building. So if we start with the zone temperature graph in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we can first see that the, the building was in setback mode up until about 6 a.m. in the morning and then entered optimum start where it brought the temperatures into the range for occupancy. Uh, and then it went back into setback mode again at about 7 o'clock at night uh, because that's the schedule of this building. And we don't need to maintain heating or cooling temperature in the building outside of the operating hours. We can also see the controller temperature uh, b uh, below that in the, in, in the bottom left. Um, and in this day, on August 22nd of this year, uh, it actually was using the economizer uh, uh, quite a bit uh, up until about noon. Uh, because the outside temperature that day wasn't terribly hot, and uh, with the cooling demand, uh, there, was, there was some call to bring in, uh, to bring in air uh, to, that could free cool the building at that point. Um, that, that was mostly driven by that, not actually by occupancy load. On, mo on a lot of other days, we don't see a lot of fresh air being brought into this building because the CO2 levels just don't get that high. But wherever we can use free cooling, we're going to save energy. Then on the right-hand side, we have the economizer graph, which shows the real-time output and feedback of the economizer position, as well as the fan pressure uh, graph, which is showing how the fan is modulating. So on the economizer graph, we can see again, it matching up with the controller temperature, there's, there's, a, there's a bump in the morning from about 6 a.m. to noon, and then the economizer dropped off because it got too hot uh, in after, after noon during the day. But it, the, the fact is, because we're doing demand control ventilation in the system, we already had enough fresh air in the building. It basically used almost no fresh air for the rest of the day up until about a little bit uh, between 6 and 8 o'clock at night. And the pressure graph, we get a spike in the morning, um, and then it kind of levels off through the day. And really, the fan speed on the system almost never exceeded 50% during the day because of the demand and because of the modulation. This is an efficient HVAC system. But one thing I'd like to point out is that if we look, go back to the controller temperature graph on the bottom left, there is a, a yellow line uh, first thing in the morning where there was a fault. And, and, and it called this fault right away. It produced a notification. And the question is, why? What, what was this fault? And, and the, question, the answer to that question lies in the economizer graph in the upper right. If, we, if you take a close look, you can see that it, the, at, at, in the morning when the system went into this optimum start mode, that the economizer was called to open up 100%, uh, both to, mostly to provide some free cooling uh, to, the, to the building to get the temperatures down because the air temperature outside was still relatively cool at that point. But the feedback signal, which is in gray, uh, did not meet uh, what the control system was commanding the economizer to do. Therefore, it immediately faulted. So the building operator knows. Now, that's not to say the economizer wasn't working right, but as far as the control system knew, it wasn't working right. So it immediately calls out for a technician to go on the roof to look at the, to look at the linkages, to look at to see what the economizer is doing, and to make sure that problem's fixed before the next day rolls around. Um, a lot of times, the, our control systems don't do that. That economizer could silently fail until maybe the six-month inspection falls out when the HVAC trades come in, um, and we'd never know it. And we would have lost all that efficiency, or if the economizer actually wasn't opening, uh, our CO2 levels in our space would have, uh, would have increased, our indoor air quality would have been there, people would have been getting drowsy, and ultimately, productivity of the people uh, in this commercial office space would have gone down if it had failed in, in that direction. So either way, we need to look at it from, uh, from those perspectives. 
So there's the, uh, there's the arrows. We can see the fault on the yellow, and then we can see where the, where the fault is on the economizer graph. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending my uh, presentation today. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about some of the best practices in uh, demand control ventilation, and, uh, and I hope you find this useful in order to look ahead and to, to really go back and take a look at your rooftop units, take a look at your controls, make sure that you're ventilating on demand, make sure your economizers are working, and, and make sure your controls are where they need to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm.